Let's continue on with looking at the idea of self-regulation. So I think as teachers in the 21st century, I think you have to consider that students might be coming to you without this sense of self-regulation. So how they, they might be coming to you with, without tools to actually regulate their own behavior. And let's jump into why this might why this might be, <clears throat> or maybe like our Socrates quote, maybe students are coming to student to school with with a sense of self regulation, but we're just not recognizing it. Okay, so but we're going to kind of go the way that students are not coming to school being as self regulated as they have in the past. So. Students do not know nowadays what it feels like to be calm anymore. I think they're dealing with an overwhelming amount of stress in their lives, all the way from our K's to our grade 12's. And some say it's because of technology and social media. Um, of course, the jury, the jury is out on that because it's so new and we don't know yet really the effects of technology on on our well-being on our social emotional learning um, but it would kind of make sense because these kids are on all the time <clears throat> right they they never get a break from connection with people they never get a chance to just be still anymore um, I, I try not to tell too many when I was a child stories, but when I was growing up, I went to school and then I came home and I got off the bus and that was basically it. I grew up, I had a party line phone for those of you who, uh, it was like one phone for three households. And so you couldn't even talk on the phone to your friends because your neighbor down the road was like, Hey, get off the phone. Uh, and so I, I had a chance to shut down and to not be part of sort of the social chaos that these kids are, you know, with phones and constant connection and, and gaining their self-esteem from how many likes and how many, uh, like how many likes they have on a post. Like it, it I, I do think these kids in this generation are dealing with stress that is unprecedented in any in any other generation. Also, when our kids are not self-regulated and they come and they're all wound up and they're stressed, they go into fight or flight mode. And basically that is um, the reaction to a survival reaction. And so when they are in the state, when cortisol is flying through their head and flying through their body, there there's no learning that can happen. So if our kids are coming and they're not feeling regulated and they're feeling stressed out we very little learning is happening and so we can blame all sorts of other things uh, parents social media technology phones but ultimately we're going to have to deal we're going to have to figure out how to deal with this so the next point students may know how to behave in class but they lack the skills to act appropriately. So say for example, a student may know that when they're starting to feel overwhelmed, maybe by the content of an assignment, so they're starting to get really anxious, and maybe they know that if they take 10 deep breaths, that that will help, but maybe they're feeling sort of socially self-conscious, like the person beside them is gonna be like, why are you deep breathing in social studies class? Um, and so they might know how to, like what to do, but they lack the skills to actually take the initiative to do it. Okay, so I think the teachers will need to be able to de-escalate children in their class when they start to see them getting anxious or starting to go into that fight or flight mode. Uh, student, teachers will have to know their kids well enough to know their individual triggers as well as no, you know, two or three tools. What can I give this child to, to use right now? Is it just, is it simply 10 deep breaths? Is it that they need to, um, 
<coughs> go go for a, a, a walk with an aide or they need to go into the tent as a little bit of a just a timeout do they need to put on headphones so that they don't have so much noise coming in so again those are those are those kind of those kind of things that they need to do i think also teachers need to model their own self-regulation so if the teacher is feeling frustrated you might even want to say i'm feeling a little frustrated right now and i know that if i just take 10 deep breaths that will calm me down and then actually take the 10 deep breaths and so that the children go oh oh that's that's what i need to do uh, and sometimes that will just be the um, the the impetus for a child actually implementing strategies that he or she knows will work um, for him or her. Specifically, we I think in this day and age we need to explicitly teach self regulation uh, uh, concepts and strategies through actually like lessons, and it doesn't need to be like okay here's our self regulation lesson, but sort of integrated as the topic comes up in the class. So taking time to actually teach some of these things in the moment, or maybe teaching them preventatively because you can you kind of get a sense of what's gonna happen in your classroom, okay? So for example, name some of the stressors. Name some of the stressors for your kids. It, they'll be different in grade four or grade seven or grade 12. Um, look at what happens to their emotions and actions when anxious, uh, when they're bored, when they're angry, and, and get them to sense that they are actually in control of these of their reactions. Uh, if you ever have ever read Man's, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, it's an amazing book about uh, a fellow who is in the uh, Nazi war, um, the Hala Erta, oh, the, in the, it lived in the Holocaust and was in is in the camp or it was in, lived in the camp, and he, he stayed focused on that nobody could take away his how he reacted to the situation, and I think that kids think everything happens to them and that they have no control over their reaction and. Uh, we need to counter that with absolutely you have control over quite a bit more than you think you do but then actually kind of going through some of those scenarios where do you have control and where how can you actually control your reactions to be a positive reaction or a negative reaction okay so that's the specifically teach some of these self-regulation skills and some of this social emotional language that kids need to know and again allow students to actually use the strategies so if you say you know if you're feeling like you're being triggered you need to take 10 breaths then make sure that you let the child take 10 breaths and that nobody ridicules that child um, in the classroom so then allow the students to use those strategies Okay, it's a really interesting concept. Uh, I, in all my years of teaching and education, we haven't really had to talk, we haven't talked about self-regulation uh, until, until fairly recently, like the last four or five years, we've talked, we've talked more about, about this. So it, it is an interesting possible generational concept, but maybe we should have been talking about it all the way from Socrates to now. So there you go. Okay, so what I want you to do is think about where do you lie on this whole concept of teaching self self regulation. So be ready to discuss what you think about students and self regulation. Are they coming to school not knowing how to self regulate? Is it your job as a teacher, or should this lie with the parent? And how much do you think you will focus on self regulation in your classroom? It's again these are these are um, decisions that you have to make on your road to becoming the most amazing teacher that you can be. Okay. Now, we're going to shift gears a little bit here, but we're still focusing on how can we support positive classroom environment and how can we support individual students uh, in our classroom to eliminate or um, keep to a minimum classroom management or classroom behavior that we then have to react to. How can we be proactive in the classroom? So the physical environment is is a huge part of how our classroom management 
goes. Okay, so in a well-designed element classroom, you want desk arrangements. Actually, I'm just going to grab my pencil here. Desk arrangements that encourages cooperative work and positive social interaction. But again, realize that some children maybe can't handle this kind. So maybe they have a little bit of a table over here on their own. You want to have a nice little library center. So uh, I don't see a library center in here, but a lot nice little library center. You want to have a separate area for working either with pen and paper or with or with computers. Uh, you want to set it up so all students have sight line to the teacher. So in this classroom, kids can see if the teacher's standing here, they can see. Nothing like if you are at the back of the class and you can't actually see the teacher, you then sort of disengage. Lots of nice natural light. Oh, it's so important to have natural light. Open those curtains, get those curtains tied back and let lots of natural light in. Sometimes you want subdued colors, so calm colors. There was a reason why years ago McDonald's used to be bright red and bright yellow. Uh, because they actually didn't want people to linger there very long. They wanted to get people to get in, eat, and get out so they could put more customers through. Uh, that's kind of not what you want in a classroom. You want to have subdued colors that are calming. Blue is a water color, so it's very calming. So this teacher has lots of blue in the class. Red is hot, and so it makes some kids... Um, it, it sets them off just because of the color scheme. Um, make sure that, that things like cubbies are easily accessible and maybe have things in a couple places so that you don't have a jam. You don't have a jam of students all in the same place all at the same time. Uh, try to avoid creating an area where there's going to be a traffic jam. Again, if you, if probably this hopefully isn't the door hopefully the door is this way so that you don't have all kids having to go through this little narrow narrow area um put up student artwork in the classroom so hopefully this is some student artwork up here there's nothing like having uh your a student having their artwork in posted in the classroom um, I, there's not one in this classroom, but if you can, actually, I'm going to go off the pencil here. If you can have an aquarium or a terrarium or a class pet, like a hamster or something, you have to make sure that you're willing to take care of the animal over, uh, Christmas holidays and summer holidays and things like that. But even having something living, even having some plants in your classroom that are actually living, there's a calming effect. I um I had student teachers that were at a uh, high school in Calgary, and I walked into the, it was a science you know biology biology uh, classroom, and I walked in and this teacher had this whole terrarium with plants and um, tons of plants, and it was the classroom. It was I just went. Oh, it had lots of oxygen, it was humid, it was warm, and it just, the kids were just calm. These high school kids were calm in there because the actual physical environment was so calm. And um, I used to try to go there kind of just before lunch so that I could just calm down and then have a nice, have a nice lunch. If I went there after lunch, I was a little sleepy, uh, but it totally, the kids were totally different in that class because I saw them in other classes and they they acted differently in that particular classroom. Um, have some fidget stuff. Okay, I'm gonna go back to my pencil here if you can. So again, for those kids who just, uh, you know, instead of sitting on a, on a regular chair, maybe they have an exercise ball so they can be going back and forth and that just keeps them, keeps them engaged. If you can have a carpet, so many good things happen on the carpet. It gives those kids a sense, uh, gives those kids who don't have a lot of positive physical interaction in their lives. It gives them a chance to have some really positive, controlled physical interaction in their lives. Um, oh, if you can, in your physical classroom, have access to the outside. IF Cox is built in, uh, in Redcliffe. The school IF Cox has actually doors to the outside so at uh like throughout the day they can go into this little area that's fenced it's a little weird but um uh like that there's a big fence around 
but then it's totally accessible and the kids can go out and have a little break or you can go out and do some do some of your lessons outside and it's actually you just open the door and go out so that's a really great way to uh, use your physical environment to enhance the positive learning experience in your class I uh, have a private this is what I was when I was talking about using a tent maybe you have like a little tent in your classroom and so that the child who just is starting to maybe feel a little overwhelmed can go into this tent and even though there's they're still in the classroom you can still see them but they have the sense that it's a it's a safe place and that's where they can go to to take control of their own social emotional behavior in there um one of one of the things I learned the hard way was don't have your pencil sharpener behind you. What happens is if your pencil sharpener is behind you, the kid will go to the pencil sharpener and then be making funny faces behind you and distracting the class. Uh, and then, uh, and, but then you can never catch them because they're behind you. Have the pencil sharpener somewhere where it's not going to do there. They, they will have no audience. The it's not facing the class and the kids can't see the, the child at the pencil sharpener. And again, you want to be thinking about setting up your physical classroom so that transitions are super easy. So here, if the students are at the carpet, then they just go boom, boom, they come around this way. So you don't have everybody having to go through this one little area. You have the light shining over so that they, so they have the light on their paper, all those kind of, all those kind of good things in there. So physical environment is, you know, we kind of just think, well, the classroom's set up. No, you have lots of choices. You have lots of choices in um, in how you actually set, how you actually set it up. Okay, what I want you to do is in Collaborate, we're going to, I want you to have a look at these pictures and have, um, think about the pros and the cons of this kind of a classroom. So what would the pros be for, for this classroom and what would the cons be? Okay, so I want you to do that for this picture. For this picture, there are pros and cons. There are definitely pros and cons to this kind of this kind of a classroom. How about this kind of a classroom? Pros and cons. Think about all the things we talked about, all the things we talked about in this course. What's a pro and a con of this particular classroom? This sort of open concept, open concept classroom. So that's what we'll discuss in Collaborate around, around the physical environment. Okay, so I'm going to sum this up with effective classroom management results in, and I'm going, you're going to hear this again, positive student behaviors, which is what we want, enhanced student psychological security, because we know they can't learn anything unless they're feeling psychologically secure, and better teaching and learning, which is ultimately what we want. All right, take care, everybody.